medcram.com. Okay, well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about urinalysis again, and this time we're going to go into the urinalysis of glucose, ketones, bilirubin, urobilinogen, and specific gravity with respect to the urine. Okay, let's get started with glucose. We use a peroxide method, which will become important later. So we use peroxides to measure glucose, a peroxide reaction. And the thing that you should know that's important is that when blood goes to the nephron, there is a barrier there in the nephron that is preventing glucose from being spilled into Bowman's capsule and the proximal convoluted tubule. So if you can kind of imagine a dam with a wall and there is water, so long as the water doesn't go over that dam wall, there won't be spillage over it. That's the same analogy that we use with glucose. And the number that you should know for glucose is called the TM, which stands for the transport maximum. And in this case, that number is 180 micrograms per deciliter, which means that if the glucose concentration is greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter, then there could be spillage of glucose into the urine. But if it is less, than 180 milligrams per deciliter, there should not be. So you should know that there are SGLT2 inhibitors, and these are the medications for diabetes that end in flozin, like empagliflozin and the paclofloxin. These are medications that actually work by dumping glucose into the urine. And so it can cause glycosuria even though there is a normal or elevated blood glucose, but not above the 180 that we talked about. A positive urine glucose on these agents does not necessarily indicate hyperglycemia. Now, if you do get that, you're going to have glucose that's going to be found in the urine, and that has the effect of drawing in fluid because of its osmotic principle, and you're going to get an osmotic diuresis. But we'll talk about that. So again, remember, peroxidase and also 180 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so what you're going to see on a test, on a urine test, it's either going to be negative or it's going to be positive and degrees of positivity. As we talked about before, there is a way to make this thing a false negative, and so you have to be careful of that. If the patient is taking high levels of vitamin C, that can make glucose, even though there is glucose in the urine, it could make it look negative. So there are things that can metabolize the vitamin C so you don't get those false negatives. Just so you're aware, in terms of positive, you could have a trace, you can have a 1 plus, a 2 plus, a 3 plus, and a 4 plus, and these generally are associated with approximately 100 milligrams per deciliter, 250, 500, 1,000, and up to 2,000 milligrams per deciliter in the urine. Okay, so you could get quite a bit of spillage of glucose in the urine. Okay, so what does this mean? You see a positive glucose going on. What does that mean? There's two possibilities using our analogy. Either you've got a bad wall, okay, that means that the dam wall is not holding back the water and it's leaking out, or you've got spillover. Okay, so the bad wall is much more rare and the spillover is much more common. So let's talk about the bad wall first. This is sometimes known as Fanconi's syndrome. With Fanconi's syndrome, you have a problem with reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule. So you also see dumping of phosphate. You'll also see dumping of uric acid. You'll also see dumping of bicarbonate. Now, if you remember, if you don't reabsorb bicarbonate well at the proximal convoluted tubule, this is known as a renal tubular acidosis type two. Okay, and that gets into the pH. And then of course, the other thing that you see that gets dumped are amino acids. Now, what are things that can cause this Fanconi syndrome? Well, you could have something called multiple myeloma. That is a cancerous disease where you have plasma cells that overpopulate. Other things that could do this would be heavy metals. Other things that could do this would be medications. For instance, Tenovir, which is an HIV medication. Chemotherapeutic agents like cisplatin. 
can do it. Another medication that's used in mood disturbances, that's VPA or valproic acid. And then uh, antibiotic, which is used commonly, is aminoglycosides. So that would be like gentamicin, tobramycin, amikacin. So aminoglycosides can do this. So all of these causes can cause the Fanconi syndrome where you have a bad wall. So in terms of spillover though, where the wall is fine, but you just have too much glucose in the blood, the biggest one there you gotta know about is diabetes. And of course you can have type one, you can have type two, uh, you could have even gestational diabetes that could do it. And anything basically that'll increase your blood glucose, for instance, Cushing's disease, that could do it. And that list goes pretty deep. So those are the causes of glucose in the urine. Okay, let's change up the color a little bit. Let's talk about ketones. So ketones in the urine, it's not usually as useful as serum ketones, now that those are more available. So this is kind of an older test. The way that those are checked for is something that you should know called the nitroprusside test. So what are the major reasons why somebody would have ketones in their urine? Uh, one of them is alcohol. So alcoholic ketosis. Another one would be, of course, DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis. And then finally, the last one would be starvation, ketoacidosis. So what are ketones specifically? Well, the thing that you've got to remember is in the cell, you've got the nucleus, of course, but you've got these mitochondria all throughout. And in the mitochondria, inside them specifically, are where fatty acids get transported into the matrix of the mitochondria where something called beta oxidation occurs. And beta oxidation takes fatty acids and transforms them into acetyl-CoA, which are two carbon units. So these two carbon units, if there's a lot of this fatty acid transformation into two carbon units, a lot of acetyl-CoA becomes available. And normally that acetyl-CoA, as you already know, should go into the Krebs cycle. But if there's too much of it around and the Krebs cycle can't handle it, then they start to coalesce with each other. And so if you have this acetyl-CoA, which looks somewhat like this, and you bind these together, you're going to get things like acetoacetate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetone. If you have two of these, you're going to make one acetoacetate. And what does acetoacetate look like? It looks like this. And there's one, two, three, four carbons. Now, acetoacetate can be converted and goes back and forth to beta-hydroxybutyrate to look like this. And as you can see here, we have a carbonyl group being reduced to a hydroxy group. And so because this is being reduced, something has to be oxidized. And that's where you take NADH and you oxidize it to NAD+. So you can get beta-hydroxybutyrate, you can get acetoacetate. Of course, what you can do is you could simply just chop off the CO2 and then what you would get then is simply acetone, which you breathe off. So when you do the nitroprusside test, it checks for specifically acetoacetate. And the way it does that is through this nitroprusside reaction, which involves nitroferrocyanide, which turns it a nice purplish blue. And that's why we're kind of writing it in blue here. And what would you get? So with ketones, you're either going to get a negative or a positive. And if you get a negative or a positive, you're going to get this purple color that's going to turn the ketones positive. But there's also different levels of positive. There's trace, there's 1+, plus, 2+, plus, 3+, plus, and 4+. Plus. And so for trace, that works out to be about 5 milligrams per deciliter. 1+, plus is 15. 2+, plus is 40. 3 plus is 80, and 4 plus finally is about 160 or more. Thing here that you should know is that if ketones are positive, you really should be checking them in the serum.